Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Today we have a special guest. We have our own Johannes uh, that came to uh, chat with us. So Johannes, as you know, joined us in July last year. He's, managed, uh, he's the manager of our arena grant with the uh, PCVD, Passivated Contact. Johannes did his uh, physics study in uh, Switzerland, and then he joined the, um, the group of Christoph Balif and Stefan DeWolf in EPFL and did his PhD there, and that will be the topic of his con talk, seminar. Uh, after that, he worked for Maya Berger and uh, Remind me the name? Indi Indiotech. Indiotech. <laughs> so he's quite expert in PCVD systems. So because of that, we saw that it will be great to have him here. Um, if you don't know him because of his PCVD work, probably you know him because of yoga. So he also <laughs> run our <laughs> weekly yoga classes. If you haven't heard about that, ask him and join him on Tuesdays, 5 o'clock? 6. 6 o'clock. Yeah. OK. So please welcome Johannes. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, thanks a lot, Ziv, uh, for the introduction, and uh, welcome everyone uh, to the SPRI seminar today. Um, well, as already introduced, I'm going to present um, the work that I did during my PhD. And uh, as the title already suggests, it's going to be on heterojunction solar cells. And more specifically, what I was uh, doing research on was um, uh, the window layers in these devices and uh, trying to understand how the properties impact the device performance. So first of all, uh, to give you a short reminder uh, how uh, heterojunctions are fabricated. Uh, so uh, as any uh, crystalline silicon uh, device, it starts off with a silicon wafer, which is cleaned and textured. And for uh, heterojunctions, we use plasma-enhanced chemical vapor de deposition, or PECVD, uh, to deposit amorphous silicon layers. First, intrinsic, to passivate uh, both uh, sides of the, the wafer. And then we use the same technique to deposit a P-doped amorphous silicon layer at the front uh, for hole collection, and an N-doped uh, amorphous silicon layer at the back for um, electron collection. This is then followed by a sputtering step um, where uh, at the front and the back uh, TCO, so a so-called transparent conductive oxide, is uh, deposited, uh, which uh, acts as an anti-reflective coating, but also uh, to enable lateral transport for the carriers. Uh, finally, we also use a sputtering step uh, to deposit a metallic layer at the back, in that case silver, and uh, screen printing to define the pattern or the grid pattern uh, for the uh, contacts at the front of the device. With this structure uh, in industry, um, you find, or like uh, groups have published uh, record efficiencies for the standard device, which you see here, which has two contacts, one on the front, one on the back, where uh, a record is currently 25.1%. And for the same technology, so heterojunctions, but with contacts only at the rear, uh, people uh, published um, uh, record efficiency of 26.7. So uh, this uh, heterojunction device uh, has a few challenges, um, which uh, I will briefly discuss in the following. So one of them is uh, optical losses. So if you look at uh, the front layers only, which uh, we will speak about in the uh, following uh, slides as well, um, you can have parasitic absorption, which means that uh, the light that is absorbed in these layers generates charge carriers. However, these ca uh, charge carriers will not contribute to the power output of the, the, of the device. Uh, same can happen at the um, rear, where we more speak of uh, free carrier absorption in the transparent conductive oxide layer or plasmonic losses in the metal. 
And uh, this has been quantified um, by Zachary Holman for the uh, devices that we uh, were working on uh, back in 2012 um, to be uh, minus uh, in current at the front of 2.1 and uh, 0.5 at the rear. Then if you look at the electrical losses, so of course we have uh, the crystalline silicon wafer which has an interface and this interface by definition is very defective. So um, besides the intrinsic recombination pathways inside the bulk, we of course also have surface recombination, which in total uh, lowers the VOC, so the open circuit voltage that you can obtain um, as well as the fill factor. And uh, then, we, in, in addition to that, we also have uh, the, the interfaces between the, the amorphous silicon and the transparent conductive oxide at the front and the rear. And uh, there you can have uh, effects like uh, Schottky barriers forming that um, will also lower the, the fill factor. <coughs> so, in my work during my PhD, I was uh, trying to use uh, alternative materials, namely microcrystalline silicon and amorphous silicon oxide to replace the standard layers as shown here. And also um, uh, atomic layer deposited uh, zinc oxide, which was doped by uh, aluminum uh, to replace the TCO layers at the front and the rear. And all this with the goal of, um, well, uh, trying to uh, reduce the, the electric and optical losses. Um, so what I did was to develop uh, plasma enhanced chemical vapor deposition processes for these materials and uh, did studies to try and understand how these uh, materials and their properties impact uh, the cell uh, performance. So coming to the outline uh, of my talk, so what I'm going to speak about more in detail is going to be white band gap materials, namely these uh, silicon oxide layers, then also temperature coefficients and temperature effects. In the second part, then I will concentrate more on uh, the alternative transparent uh, conductive oxides or transparent layers, as well as organic uh, overlayers. And uh, finally, I will talk about uh, nanocrystalline uh, silicon layers, which is actually also the, uh, one of the main parts of my thesis. And in the end, I will spend a few minutes on uh, linking all this to what I'm doing here at uh, UNSW. So for um, amorphous silicon oxide layers, uh, the motivation is quite clear. So uh, what we want is we want to have layers at the front side of the device um, which are more transparent and uh, therefore increase the current output of the device. So we replaced uh, the standard amorphous silicon, intrinsic amorphous silicon layer by a stack of amorphous silicon and amorphous silicon oxide as shown here. And uh, hope that with this we would uh, gain in, uh, in short circuit current density. So in this study what we did was to vary the thickness of this, uh, of this oxide layer and uh, the, the deposition, position, uh, deposition parameters or um, gas flow ratios in that case, so the CO2 to silane flow ratio, as well as the device structure. So looking at the, the optic optical properties of these uh, materials, uh, here you can see the results that we obtained from um, ellipsometry measurements where we see that both the um, refractive index and the extinction coefficient go down when we increase the CO2 to silane flow ratio. So we put CO2 and silane in the, 
uh, plasma uh, in the PCVD reactor and uh, uh, just by increasing the CO2, uh, we increase uh, the, um, uh, the incorporation of oxygen uh, into the layer and therefore we have this decrease. And this is also reflected by a change in band gap, which we estimated to um, uh, an increase in band gap of 0.1 electron volts for the layer that was deposited at CO2 to silin of 2.5. Um, however, this is not the entire story. So what we also notice is that uh, there's not only oxygen that is going into the layer, but also hydrogen. And this we investigated a bit more in detail using thermal desorption spectroscopy. So just for those who are not familiar with this uh, technique, it's uh, basically as uh, follows. So you have a, a stage where you will place your sample. This is placed in ultra high vacuum. The stage is heated as well as the sample. And uh, what you will analyze afterwards is uh, the gases that will desorb from your sample. And doing this, uh, you can have a look at uh, hydrogen, for instance, the molecular hydrogen that comes out of your sample. And uh, while ramping up the temperature, you just count how much hydrogen is coming out. So uh, what we learn from this is, well, first of all, uh, you can see that for the um, layer deposited at 0.4 CO2 to silane, uh, we have two peaks, one at low temperature and one at higher temperature, um, which are uh, linked to hydrogen bonded either weakly or strongly in, uh, in the matrix of the amorphous silicon. And uh, what we see if we now increase uh, from 0.4 to 2.5 is that this spectrum changes. So we have an increase at low temperature of the uh, peak value of this low temperature peak and a decrease at, um, uh, at higher temperatures. And what we learned from this is that uh, the structure of the layer actually gets more and more porous because the hydrogen inside these pores is uh, bound uh, not as strongly as in the amorphous uh, matrix. And uh, if you consider the, the area below the curves, you can learn something uh, about the, the actual amount of hydrogen in the layers. So doing this, we uh, estimated an increase uh, of uh, hydrogen in the layer of 20% uh, relative. <coughs> so this uh, was then the explanation why we see this, uh, uh, this decrease in, uh, in refractive index and extinction coefficient or the widening of the band gap. And implementing these layers now into a device, uh, namely a device with a the P amorphous layer at the front and the um, amorphous silicon oxide layer below the P layer also at the front. We did a series of, uh, of samples with uh, different CO2 to silent flow ratios and varied the thickness of this oxide layer. For the, the implied VOC values that are shown here, uh, we see that they are basically more or less the same for all the devices and uh, are in a range between uh, 720 to 730 millivolts. Uh, as for the current, um, we saw for some an increase uh, of uh, up to 0.4 with respect to the reference. However, looking at the fill factor and the, the efficiency, the um, yeah, something quite significant happens. And uh, this is where you, when you increase the, um, the CO2 to silane flow ratio and the thickness, you see a steeper and steeper decrease in fill factor as uh, shown down here. So uh, 
To investigate that a little bit more, uh, we did a permutation of uh, the structure. So instead of having only our reference or uh, the, uh, the oxide layer below the P layer, we also had a device with an oxide layer below the N layer, but uh, the polarity uh, inversed, so the N layer at the front. And uh, then we took these samples and uh, did temperature-dependent IV measurements. And uh, looking at the fill factor here only uh, for the reference device, you see that with increasing temperature, you have a decrease in fill factor, which is uh, expected. And, um, oops, <laughs> that was a bit too much. <laughs> yeah, um, so you can see that also uh, shown here in the, um, in the IV curve. However, looking at the, um, so, Looking down here at the, uh, the sample with an oxide layer below the P layer, we see that we start off with a very low uh, fill factor and increasing the temperature, we uh, increase the, the fill factor again. And uh, this is due to the fact that we start off with an IV curve which is um, S-shaped and with increasing temperature, this S-shape disappears. We were able to link that to the fact that we have a, an increased uh, valence band offset, as shown in this sketch here, uh, where we have um, basically a, a, a barrier for holes. So we don't collect the holes as efficiently as for the standard device. And only at uh, higher temperature, these holes can uh, surmount the, the barrier and be collected more efficiently. And um, well, we did this same experiment for the um, for the n-type case, so having uh, an oxide layer below the uh, the n-type uh, amorphous silicon layer, and there we didn't see this effect. So this is indeed um, a confirmation that it's the holes that are mostly affected by this uh, amorphous silicon oxide layer. Uh, and using this structure, you could expect a potential gain um, in, uh, in efficiency uh, with respect to the current. So looking, well, since we now were speaking about uh, temperature dependencies, uh, I want to come to my next topic, which is uh, the uh, temperature coefficients. And here our motivation was to uh, link what we see in the IV uh, characteristics of the device, which is shown here, to what we observe when we measure uh, lifetime. And uh, well, what we did was to, uh, to measure lifetime as a function of temperature. And as shown in this graph, for a wafer that is, was passivated by uh, IN and IP stacks at the back and the front, uh, we saw an increase in lifetime. And uh, this, we, uh, this can be explained by a change in uh, recombination statistics or capture cross-sections with temperature. And our goal was now to understand how this change in lifetime uh, links to uh, the temperature coefficients of uh, the cell parameters. So uh, looking at the lifetime curves and more specifically at the points uh, of interest uh, which are related uh, to the open circuit voltage, like indicated here. Um, we saw that uh, the, the actual point of the VOC shifts slightly to higher um, effective minority carrier densities. And the same is true for uh, the, um, the maximum power point. Uh, yeah. Um, so we were able to actually link uh, these changes uh, to an, and uh, like see an effect in the temperature coefficients of these um, 
figures. And um, taking it a step further, we uh, investigated together with Jan Haschke, a former uh, colleague of mine, a set of uh, different cell technologies as depicted here and measured again all these samples uh, as a function of temperature and saw that um, the temperature coefficient of the VOC increases with VOC at 25 degrees, which confirms what uh, Martin Green uh, published in 1985. Uh, so when, uh, yeah, you really want to have a high VOC if, uh, in order to have a, a good temperature coefficient. And uh, Jan took it even a step further and compared uh, these devices to uh, modules um, and uh, yeah, investigated their temperature coefficient. And what he saw there is that in terms of uh, VOC and JSC, the um, uh, temperature coefficients are similar. However, for the temperature coefficient of the uh, voltage at maximum power, uh, it is in, the, in fact worse for modules. And he was able to link that to uh, the additional series resistance that comes from the interconnection uh, of the cells inside a module. So his conclusion was that in order to have a very high performant module uh, that you would like to maybe uh, deploy in hot and sunny uh, climates, uh, you need to, um, to have a very high VOC and uh, interconnections between the cells that, are, uh, that have a low resist uh, resistivity. <coughs> so um, from this, I would like to change topics now and uh, talk about the uh, alternative transparent electrodes. So uh, again, one motivation uh, to, or one goal was to, to reduce the, the optical losses uh, at the front of the heterojunction device. Uh, one way to do that would be to reduce the thickness of the amorphous layers. And, uh, and thereby increase the current output. However, doing so, uh, if you use sputtering, uh, you can end up with a very severe drop in lifetime, uh, and uh, as shown here. So if you, <coughs> if you look at the lifetime curve here, which is the as-deposited uh, lifetime, uh, after sputtering a TCO layer, in that case ITO, uh, you, you end up with a lifetime that is much lower. Um, however, you can recover this a little bit at least, uh, especially at uh, higher injection levels um, by an annealing step, which is typically done uh, during the curing of the silver paste after screen printing. But at lower injection levels, the lifetime remains uh, yeah, still quite low. For the, for the case of an N-type wafer passivated with IP stacks on both sides. And this can be explained by a mismatch in work function uh, between the TCO layer and uh, the amorphous silicon layers, and uh, which leads to a higher uh, recombination at the interface. Um, so the solution, well, looking again at, um, at these points of interest for the, the VOC and, uh, and um, voltage at maximum power, uh, to reduce the losses for the VOC, you want to have a deposition technique that is as soft as possible, so you don't want to introduce a lot of damage. And for the loss that you uh, can expect from a lower lifetime or especially also a shift in uh, injection level for the point of the, the voltage of at maximum power point, you want to have a, a TCO layer that is uh, optimized for this contact. 
Um, however, this is not the entire story. Uh, as published by Adachi et al., um, you also need to have a, an interface with a very uh, low defect uh, density. So what we did was um, to use um, uh, atomic layer deposited uh, zinc oxide to try and protect our amorphous layers from uh, sputter damage. And indeed, as shown here in uh, these PL images, where red is the, shows a very high lifetime and uh, blue a low lifetime, you can see that uh, if you insert an, a zinc oxide layer between the amorphous layers and the TCO layer, uh, starting from a thickness of uh, more than 10 nanometers of zinc oxide, you can protect uh, the, the underlying uh, layers from sputter damage. However, in this study, which is also published in, uh, in JPV, um, we saw that uh, by introducing these uh, zinc oxide layers, you can end up with a, a loss in in fill factor due to increased uh, series resistance. And uh, what we also uh, looked at was how the zinc oxide layers um, affect differently passivated uh, wafers. So here, for instance, a wafer passivated by IP stacks uh, on both sides. And as you can see, for the lifetime, uh, with increasing uh, zinc oxide thickness, you see a decrease in lifetime. So this will, of course, lower again the, the implied fill factor and also the fill factor that you expect in, uh, um, in the device in the end. Whereas if you deposit this aluminum oxide, uh, no, not this zinc oxide, sorry, um, layer on, an, uh, on a wafer with N-type, uh, layers, uh, you see the opposite trend. So uh, this is really a, a strong uh, argument to uh, try and uh, like engineer the work function of your materials in a way that uh, they match the different, uh, the different contacts that you want to have. And we tried this also using uh, organic overlayers. In that case, we uh, used polished wafers uh, passivated by uh, either IN or IP stacks and spin coated uh, PVK on top and uh, investigated then the, the lifetime again. And there, con uh, in contrast to what we saw before, we uh, see a decrease in lifetime for the IN samples whereas an increase for the IP samples. So it's really a, a question of which material uh, you, you uh, use, uh, how this uh, evolves. And changing um, the doping of these PVK layers, we were actually able to show that uh, by increasing the doping, we uh, increase the, uh, this effect and gain more and more in lifetime. <coughs> so this brings me to the last section of my talk before I, w I talk about the, uh, yeah, what I do here at uh, UNSW. So um, the topic here is uh, nanocrystalline silicon layers and the motivation of these uh, for these, uh, or for using these materials is that they're both optically but also electrically uh, very interesting for heterojunctions. So optically, uh, thanks to their indirect band gap, uh, they uh, should have a, a better uh, response in the blue, so at short wavelengths, whereas electrically, um, thanks to their higher doping efficiency, uh, because they have little crystallites in the matrix, they can help to suppress uh, Schottky barriers. Uh, for the deposition of these layers, there are 
however, a few requirements. So one of them is fast nucleation. So um, since in uh, silicon heterojunction, we are talking about uh, tens of nanometers for the different layers. You, of course, you want to have uh, a layer that nucleates fast because uh, uh, you don't want to have a very thick layer. And um, nanocrystalline silicon has the, uh, like the, the growth mode of nanocrystalline silicon is normally uh, that it starts with an amorphous uh, incubation layer and then it starts crystallizing. So you want to reduce this incub incubation time to a minimum. Then the other requirement is to have sufficiently high uh, crystallinity and most importantly you want to deposit these layers uh, in a very soft manner because you don't want to destroy the passivation layers uh, below. So without going too much into detail here, um, I tried uh, like a big variety of different uh, strategies to uh, get these uh, nanocrystalline layers working, uh, which included different uh, pretreatments, nucleation layers, different uh, precursor gases, and uh, last but not least also different um, deposition uh, conditions and found that uh, indeed the, this last one was the most uh, successful one. And like trying all these um, deposition uh, conditions and uh, strategies, uh, we were able to show that uh, we can indeed gain in current, uh, for instance shown here for this sample, uh, but also in fill factor and in the end we uh, obtained a champion device of 20.9% uh, uh, conversion efficiency. <coughs> so in total we were able to uh, gain in current up to 1 milliamp per square centimeter with respect to our uh, reference sample. Uh, gain up to 2% in, uh, in fill factor, 2% uh, absolute, whereas uh, keeping the VOC uh, stable um, at uh, around 720 millivolts. And uh, all this was done meeting all the requirements that I cited before, so uh, fast nucleation, high crystallinity and soft deposition, and this was also achieved by using only industry compatible processes. So uh, uh, this is a process that can be directly transferred to uh, industry. And is interesting not only for the standard device, but also maybe even more so uh, for the device with uh, contacts only at the rear. Because there you have a reduced contact area and uh, any um, series resistance losses uh, will have a bigger impact, so you want to have a material that uh, can mitigate that. And indeed, a uh, former colleague of mine, Andrea Tomasi, he um, was able to uh, uh, implement these uh, microcrystalline or nanocrystalline layers uh, in, uh, in a device, so he developed a uh, fabrication process for these uh, rear contacted cells, which I just want to briefly uh, show you here. So starting from a textured wafer, uh, the passivation and anti-reflective coatings are applied by uh, uh, PECVD. Then there is one step where you uh, mask using a shadow mask at the rear and deposit um, N-type nanocrystalline layers for the hole contacts. And then this is the new thing in his uh, fabrication process is to uh, not to mask again, but to just deposit a P-doped uh, nanocrystalline layer as a blanket layer on, uh, on the entire surface and uh, create a so-called tunnel uh, IBC. So in 
comparison to the traditional or conventional way, this can uh, indeed uh, be uh, a, or has the potential to be much cheaper because you remove one masking step. Uh, for the conventional uh, cells, you would uh, mask in that step once for the N-type contact and once for the P-type contact. And uh, the way this uh, device works is, it, well, it relies on this uh, very efficient inter-band uh, tunneling uh, to collect electrons. So you will extract electrons from the wafer and they will be able to recombine with holes at this uh, interface between the nanocrystalline N and the nanocrystalline P layer. And looking at the cross-section here, um, the resistance or resistive losses and the carrier selectivity were uh, optimized uh, thanks to the high crystallinity of the, uh, of the layers. Whereas uh, in terms of uh, shunts that you might think could form because you have a touch well, it, the N-type and the P-type contacts are touching each other. This is actually not the case because uh, of the reduced lateral conductance uh, due to grain boundaries and what I mentioned before, this uh, amorphous silicon incubation layer that you have uh, here for the, under the P-contact. And with this structure, um, Andrea was uh, able to uh, get a device uh, with, with a certified efficiency of 22.61%. Uh, so this brings me to the conclusion. Uh, what we've seen today is, uh, well, I, I talked about uh, these white ga band gap uh, oxides, which you should maybe not place under the p-doped layers. Um, and uh, I discussed the, the different uh, temperature dependent uh, uh, measurements that we did, uh, showing that uh, there is indeed a, a link between uh, the, uh, well, the, the lifetime measurements at different temperatures uh, and or the effects that we see there and the measurements uh, at the IV. Um, then I also talked about uh, the alternative uh, transparent, transparent conductive oxides and uh, nanocrystalline layers, which indeed help to uh, improve the device performance. <coughs> and last but not least, I want to try to link and, uh, my uh, previous work to uh, what I'm doing here. So as Ziv already mentioned, I'm here for uh, the ARENA project uh, in which we want to um, develop transition metal oxides deposited by uh, PECVD. And uh, you might ask why transition metal oxides? So the motivation here is that uh, they have a relatively large uh, or wide band gap However, uh, depending on the material, they exhibit also uh, small uh, conduction or valence band offsets and they are therefore promising candidates for uh, electron or hole collecting layers. Um, these materials are uh, currently mainly deposited by uh, atomic layer deposition or sputtering. Uh, however, our approach is to use um, PECVD. And the reason for that is that uh, it's very common to industry and has a very high throughput. And uh, the, the parameter space uh, is relatively wide and it's possible to introduce uh, different uh, precursor gases that might help us to uh, tune the material properties and growth modes. However, there are also, of course, a few challenges. So uh, the deposition might not be uh, easy to get uh, uniform as uniform, and uh, the material, uh, the material's thermal stability could also be an issue. 
uh, and it's not uh, clear yet if they will be able to passivate uh, the surfaces just like that or if it's necessary to insert uh, an additional passivation layer. Um, what's also very uh, like uh, worth to mention is that it's uh, in like uh, players in industry are uh, highly interested in this uh, project so we have strong bonds with Maya Burger and Sunrise. And uh, so coming to the um, to the results so far, what we did was to modify the AK800 PECVD tool upstairs with the help of uh, Tom uh, Puzzer and Mark Griffin. And uh, what we did was to install um, a new precursor delivery system um, which can deliver the different precursors for our transition metal oxides into uh, the PECVD reactor. Um, we installed um, a, uh, an additional shower head to distribute the precursors inside the chamber and were indeed able to deposit uh, our first layers uh, thanks to Ahn uh, who did the depositions um, and uh, also the, the characterization. Uh, so here uh, you can see the first results uh, from ellipsometry and from uh, FTIR where uh, we found that uh, yeah, basically the same results as published in, uh, in uh, literature. So we are confident that we were able to deposit these, uh, uh, in that case, uh, titanium oxide layers. Uh, besides this um, TMO project, there are a few uh, smaller projects that I'm involved in, which are listed here. So uh, we are investigating uh, the impact of the metal work function on uh, recombination together with Ahn. Um, then uh, with uh, uh, our partners at KAUST, we uh, do temperature dependent uh, measurements as well. Uh, together with Phil Hammer, uh, we are going to investigate a little bit more in detail uh, how hydrogen migrates in silicon wafers. And with Michel, uh, we are planning to uh, look into uh, defect parameters of passivated uh, uh, interfaces. And last but not least, uh, I was planning also to uh, look into uh, the cell parameter uh, recombination. So currently we have this uh, project going with uh, ANU and KAUST. However, there are also other potential uh, partners uh, where I have some links to. So in case you want to uh, know something about ASU, uh, EPFL or uh, the U University of Twente, I have uh, some contacts there. And with this, I want to thank all the collaborators back at EPFL uh, that uh, helped me during my PhD and you for your attention. Thanks for your talk. Um, could you maybe share some comments, if you have any, um, about molybdenum oxide as a whole selective uh, passivating contact? Um, well, I personally was not working on uh, molybdenum oxide. Uh, a, co a colleague of mine, uh, Jonas Geisbühler, did this work at EPFL. And uh, as far as I uh, remember, uh, he, uh, he obtained very nice results with that as well. I don't know the figures or the numbers anymore, but uh, what I remember is uh, that it's, uh, it was necessary to have a process for metallization, for instance, afterwards uh, that relied on uh, um, uh, plating because uh, the material was not thermally stable to the curing. don't know if this is what you <laughs> expected. I don't know. Uh, I mean, we can discuss also afterwards if you want. Mm. Thanks for the talk. It was really interesting. I wanted to ask you about the nanocrystalline one. 
Yeah. Um, so you said it was like kind of a techno uh, industrial technology ready yeah. to get developed. Is there any company or any startup that took this idea and put it into industry? Um, well, <laughs> uh, you can, uh, well, as Ziv said, I was working for Maya Burger <laughs> after my, my thesis, so... Um, so without reaching any contract, you can yeah. just say that, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, just with regard to the nano crystallite as well, what is the size of the nano crystallite that you grow at that time? Uh, you mean the, the size of the crystals themselves? Um, we, I think it's in the maybe like uh, five to ten nanometers, something like that. Is there any limited size, like have to be that exact five to ten, or maybe less than that or higher than that? You mean in terms of uh, in a device, if you want big grains or small grains? Um, I think that depends on uh, for what you want to use it. Like if you have uh, an IBC uh, with, um, with nanocrystalline layers, you might want to have actually a lot of smaller grains because you don't want this lateral conductance. Uh, but um, for a, a normal two-side contacted device, uh, I guess big grains should not be an issue. I have, yeah, <laughs> I have very nice talk. Uh, I have one question on the like the ALD, ALD depleted uh, AZO. So yeah. for that one, that's the reason for the like avoid the sputtering damage. So actually, in the same film, solar cell technology to avoid the sputtering technology, people use MOCVD uh, boron dot zinc oxide. Yeah. Have you ever like uh, tried like to use that one? No, we uh, we only used uh, ALD. And uh, that was in, in collaboration uh, with uh, TU Eindhoven. Yeah. Next question. Okay. So let's send Johannes again. <laughs>